Well, hello everyone, I'm David Ergen, and I want to welcome you all to the second in a series of webinars sponsored by ASTOCT. Today's uh, webinar will cover distal limb imaging, and for this we'll have the clinicians from the University of Wisconsin share with you some of our interesting standing CT cases. Our three clinical panelists from the UW include Dr. Sabrina Browns, who's head of large animal surgery and the large animal hospital. And Morning. she's a very big believer in the potential of standing CT to care for the hospital's patients. We also have Dr. Diego de Gaspari, who's clinical instructor in large animal surgery, and he's been quite involved in the scanning procedures at the hospital and can attest to the uh, clinical application of our equina, and you'll see quite a bit of him during the presentation today. And then finally, Dr. J.R. Lund, who's completing her final year of diagnostic imaging residency at the UW. Uh, she's incredibly passionate about imaging horses and always willing to try out new ideas. So I do want to encourage everyone to ask questions. For this, you can use the Q&A tab that's at the bottom of the screen and type in your question, and our panelists are standing by to answer them. So at this point, I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Lund. All right, thanks, David. Uh, and you guys can hear me okay? Yes. Great. All right, so as David said, uh, my name is J.R. Lund, and I am finishing uh, my final year in my diagnostic imaging residency at the University of Wisconsin. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with ASTO-CT and the Aquinas system since about 2018. Uh, so this talk is going to focus on the standing equine CT and particularly cases uh, of the distal limbs. Uh, I'm going to start off talking about just a, briefly about CT and how this machine works and then Diego is going to walk us through the cases. Uh, for anyone who joined us on the last webinar where we were discussing head cases and some neck cases, or the beginning of this talk is gonna be very similar. Um, I know we have uh, participants from a very varied background, general practitioners, residents, uh, equine specialists, surgeons, radiologists, and other individuals. Uh, and I'm hoping that you know, in the next hour, everyone's gonna find uh, something interesting. So just a little bit about the company. Um, so it was founded in 2015. It was really a result of a research collaboration with the University of Wisconsin uh, Madison School of Veterinary Medicine. And it's pioneering robotics in combination with helical CT scanning. This is a patented approach uh, to imaging the standing horse. And so on November 24th, 2018, uh, we commissioned the first system at the University uh, of Wisconsin School of Veterinary Medicine. Since then, we've been scanning clinical patients, uh, teaching horses, and really building a image database. We're using that for you know, teaching students, uh, training residents, collaboration with other uh, institutions. At the bottom of this slide, you'll see a YouTube link. Uh, feel free to check that out. Uh, it just has a little bit about the machine and then there's some videos on there also. Okay, so here we can see a picture of uh, the machine. And on the far left, the gantry is down in the pit flush, flush with the floor. And so that would be considered our standing mode. And then in the middle image, you can see that the gantry is raised up and that would be for scanning limbs. So it will raise up to whatever level uh, we desire, depending on how far up on the limb we want to scan. And then it will drop down and scan as it's moving down. And then on the far right, uh, it is flipped 90 degrees and is in what we would consider the head mode. And we will look at a quick video of how all of that works. Um, but this, the gantry is pretty wide, so it's 75 centimeters. And the scanning field of view is the full gantry, so the full 75 centimeters. So what that means for scanning limbs is that as long as the horse is standing on the pedestal, uh, both limbs will be scanned. Um, and historically, uh, the scanning field of view had then been our displayed field of view. Um, there are some changes that are just kind of happening now where the image is getting narrowed down uh, to help increase the resolution of the image that we are displaying. 
All right, next slide. So just a quick schematic um, for anyone who's not familiar with CT. Uh, so this just shows the x-ray tube on one side and then on the other side we have the detector array and this has uh, 24 detector rows. So then as the gantry moves around, uh, spins around creating the image, you can see on the image on the right, that circle, that's gonna be the scanned field of view. So again, I'm scanning everything uh, in that circle. And here is uh, just a, a picture of sort of the inside of the gantry. So it is a multi-detector fan beam CT scanner and it has a 24 detector rows. Uh, it, the scanning is quite fast. So it's at 36 slices per second. There's a variable helical pitch. Um, so typically we are scanning at about 0 0.55 for our pitch, um, which is pretty small, uh, but it's still a very fast scan. It is sealed. We do attempt to keep it clean. Uh, we have a bucket in there to catch any urine, um, but we, you know, we also do some procedures in there, such as scrubbing and prepping for uh, arthrography. And so far that's been tolerated fine by the machine. It is pretty rugged. It's designed to withstand a, a I think about a, a thousand pound strike force. Uh, so if a horse were to bang it or kick it, uh, it should be fine. And so far we've had some horses bang a little bit, kick a little bit, uh, and it's, it's held up great. Um, no one's really blown up in the machine. There was concern about how, how horses would tolerate the scanning. Um, and so far, horses are really tolerating it well. Uh, and there we can see the handle. Um, so it's pretty, pretty simple to operate. There's a dead man switch on the back that you can push. And then there's buttons for calibrating or scanning. And then in the middle um, bottom part, you can see the toggle. And so that's gonna be moving the gantry up, down, forward, and backward. All right, so here we have a video of the machine moving. So you can see this is gonna be in the leg mode. So it would move up and then scan on the way down. Here it's gonna rotate up to the head mode. And so pins on each side are removed. The gantry's rotated 90 degrees. The pins are replaced. And then the gantry can go up and down. So depending on the size of the horse, um, we can adjust it for that. And then this would be moving forward to position for a head scan. And then again, scanning as it moves away. And then back down into the limb mode. Okay, so for patient prep, uh, the majority of the horses are sedated in their stall, either IM or IV with ACE chromazine. We do work with a number of clinicians and the you know, number of patients that are being scanned. Um, so there's a little bit of variability in the sedation protocol based on clinician and based on um, the temperament of the patient. But I would say typically this is what we are doing. Um, so some ACE promazine in the stall. Once they are relatively calm, we walk them out into the hallway, walk them towards the scanning room. Then they're sedated IV with detomidine. Uh, we continue to prep them. We put cotton in the ears. The machine is pretty quiet, um, but just to prevent them from startling, we do always place cotton in the ears. And then everyone gets a hood with blinders on it. Um, if it was a head scan, we would also sort of tape the ears back. Um, we can dim the room if we need to. We typically don't do that for limbs. Um, we usually reserve that for scanning heads. We left this slide in from the last talk. So even though we are talking about uh, limbs today, uh, just for anyone who wasn't able to visit last time or, or watch the video and is interested. Um, so here you can see that the majority of horses that we are scanning, we are scanning in stocks. Uh, the stocks are adjustable, the headstand is adjustable. And so as we saw in the video, the gantry can go up and down and the um, headboard can move up and down. So depending on the size of the horse, we can adjust that. I'm just trying to get the video to play. So here we have just a very short video of this is what it would look like scanning in 
head mode. So you can see we move it up to desired position and then it scans on the way back. So here we have a horse. Um, so we'll play both of these videos simultaneously. So on the left, we basically raise the gantry up to the desired level. And then once it's at the desired level, then you push the scan button and it will scan on the way down. This is real time, so you can see that it's, it's pretty fast. Uh, and this horse stood remarkably well. I would say the majority of horses stand quite well. Some will move a, a little bit, um, but so far they've tolerated it quite well. And here we have a couple of videos of hind limbs, just so you can see what that looks like. There is a sensor on the um, top of the gantry, so that image on the right where it's getting close to that horse's belly. Um, there is a sensor there where it wouldn't bump into their stomach or their abdomen. And this is sort of the normal setup. So we have somebody holding the horse, somebody uh, controlling the machine, and then there is oftentimes a third individual in the room um, just to help if the horse were to start move forward or move backwards. And there is a small bit of uh, kind of dead space at the top of the gantry. Um, so when you're scanning, if you want to scan, say, the fetlock, you need to bring it just a little bit above the fetlock uh, and then scan on the way down. So radiation safety. So this machine is largely designed on the technology that is used for scanning luggage. So as you go through the airport and TSA and your, your luggage is getting scanned, we have people that are standing next to those machines um, kind of all day and we have the general public that's walking back and forth. So, so quite safe. Um, so this machine operates at a, a low um, uh, KVP and MA. So you can see the MA is about eight. Uh, so pretty low and it's shielded. So the amount, amount of leakage radiation is very, very low. So it is safe to have people in there. We always wear our dosimeter badges. Um, so far there's been no images or uh, issues with that. And then we just practice appropriate radiation safety. So you can see in that image, there is a um, shield. So if we're in a position where we can stand behind it safely, we do that. Uh, we also wear um, lead aprons, and then we minimize how many people we have in the room. Um, and I would say for kind of an average uh, limb scan, this is a, a pretty reasonable setup. We have someone in the front holding the head up. We often lift their head up just a little bit um, we feel it just helps them stand uh, more solid. So basically after the scan is done, you can see the viewing system on the left side of that picture. So we will go over there, we'll view it um, almost immediately within a minute or so and review the image for any artifacts. So if the horse has moved, uh, if that's happened, then we just rescan immediately, uh, recheck the scan again. If it was a good scan, then at that point, the horse just goes back to their stall um, the images are sent over to the PAC system, and then they're reviewed at the normal viewing station. So that is just a brief overview of the machine and how the whole scanning process works. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Diego, and he's going to walk us through a series um, of what I think are quite interesting cases. Uh, and just a reminder, if you do have any questions, there's the question chat area that you can type into. And then at the end, if there's anything you want to discuss, um, we can discuss things at the end too. Thank you very much, JR. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, so to, uh, for those of you that were with us on the last webinar, uh, this picture uh, might be familiar. Um, JR started uh, the case series uh, last time uh, showing this picture and discussing this great horse on the left, Oliver. And today you're gonna to start with one of her horses too, the horse on the right, Mark, a nine-year-old Clydesdale. Uh, this, was, this is a horse that had a long history of chronic abscessation and white line disease on the left front foot. 
And um, you will see on the left of the screen a picture of the left front foot, and on the right a video, uh, CT video of that, of that same foot. Uh, we don't always CT horses with white line disease. But we do, we started to do a lot of horses with chronic draining tracts, abscess, or uh, more severe white line disease. And we found this very helpful for us, and especially for our farriers, to determine how far back those tracts goes, or how far back or proximal we have to debride those, um, the hoof falls on those horses. So this is just the same view and a different type of image you can see on both sides of the foot, the draining tracks and the undermine hoof wall extending palmarly and proximally on that foot. This horse had um, several extensive debridements and hoof wall resection and uh, currently is doing very well. And uh, his lameness uh, improved significantly from the time uh, we started working with him. Now I'm gonna start a series of a few horses with navicular bone lesions. Um, this is probably the condition that we see here and we scan uh, most frequently uh, based on the population of horses we have around. Um, you will notice that many of the cases that I'm presenting here, they I will not show any radiographs of those cases and that is for um, a couple of reasons. And uh, the main reason is that uh, having the ability of doing a standing CT in a very quick manner and in a safe manner um, gave us the option and gave the clients the option of going straight from the localization of the pain to a more advanced imaging. Uh, so we, many of these cases, we are just taking straight to CT after discussing with the client, we still offer the option of doing radiographs. But many of our clients are just opting to um, jump straight to CT after we localize the source of lameness. And some of the horses we will show here today, they were referred to us just for imaging. So our referring veterinarians are also sending lots of cases for imaging. Uh, and some of them will send after they take radiographs in the field or some of them are sending cases straight to CT as well. So this is an 11 year old quarter horse mare. She had a history of chronic lameness of about two year duration. She was used for trail riding, but she became uh, quite severely lame at some point. The client decided to retire her and uh, once uh, we had the machine up and running, he decided to bring her here and, and uh, see if we could give her some more answers. So we did, we did evaluate this bear. She was grade four out of five lame um, on this particular limb, uh, the, right for, the right front limb. And uh, she had pain on hoof testers on both front limbs. We did a PD block on this foot and she became sound on this foot and went uh, lame on the opposite foot. So we seated her and found that quite extensive, I hope everybody can see my cursor, I found quite extensive, extensive mineralization in the area of the insertion of the deep digital flexor tendon. Uh, the area was quite wide as we can see in this axial view and quite long as you can see in the sagittal view, it, the lesion extended from the level of the navicular bone down almost to the insertion of, of the deep on the coffin bone. We also noticed some um, mineralization at the area of the impar ligament. So it's, uh, although we know that some mineralization uh, can be of questionable clinical significance, this horse had a pretty severe and extensive mineralization. As you can see, I'm gonna repeat this video so you can see on the frontal projection. Uh, if you pay attention to the Palmer aspect of P3, I'm going to pause right there. You'll see some mineralization. Uh, it's hard first to tell here what is part of the deep, what is part of the of the impar ligament. But this horse also had some navicular bone changes. We'll go back. We'll see some sclerosis on the navicular bone and those changes were bilateral. Um, we treated this mare with um, mostly with chewing. So we applied a 
rock and rail shoe uh, on both front feet to easy break over and help with the mechanics. And we started her on a cycle of pain medication. The client called us back a few weeks later, very happy and very excited because he had a sound pasture horse. He could even do some light um, riding. And so he was very satisfied. This is a 11-year-old uh, Lippi Zenner uh, that was referred to us for imaging only. Um, he had a history of chronic bilateral front limb laminus. And uh, the laminus were localized with palmar digital nerve blocks on both front feet. Um, he was mostly lame on the right front. And on the CT scan, we can see the lesions are mostly or more significant on the right front. There's some enlargement of the synovial vaginations. In other views, I don't have a video of these, but we could see a quite a, a quite good amount of sclerosis. And there's also distal border fragmentation on both of these navicular bones. I, we had radiographs from the veterinarian. These were lateral radiographs taken for ferrier work initially. And uh, I placed some sagittal views with the CT just for comparison. We, in most cases, it's very hard for us to see uh, sometimes impossible to see distal fragmentation in the lateral views and on the CT, we can, um, we can easily see them. Uh, and obviously on the other, on the uh, frontal and axial view as well. This is another horse was referred for imaging only uh, eight year old saddle bred um, gelding. Had a several month history of intermittent lameness on the left front, fore limb, um, a palmar digital nerve block was performed in the field and the horse uh, became sound after that block. Uh, here is still images. I'm going to run the video again for you to see. These are still images of CT that revealed large flexor cortical erosion that communicate with uh, the synovial invagination, as you can see in those two, two views. And uh, on the video, I'm going to pause. So you can see in a different projection. That's the large cortex defect. And um, that shows some sclerosis and deeply penetrating um, synovial invaginations. This is another horse that's referred for imaging only. Um, seven year old partner horse mare used as a reigning horse and a history of bilateral four limb lameness which has been worse than the left forelimb. Um, the CT uh, results showed the gener degenerative navicular changes worse on the left. So these images are only on the left with uh, what seems to be an osteocyst like lesion, but kind of ir irregular in shape, communicating with the synovial invagination. So with just a very large synovial invagination with irregular margins. And in this particular case, the synovial, that very large lesion, did not, uh, did not seem to communicate with the large erosion found on the flexor cortex. Again, we're going to run the video and show this in a transverse view. We can also see right there. Sorry. Right there. You can also see it's kind of a star shaped lesion on the spongiose of the bone and there is a separation uh, from that lesion to the large cortex um, erosion. So this is a 13 year old quarter horse that came in for evaluation of um, a front limb lameness that was bilateral and intermittent. Um, this horse was sensitive to hoof tester. He will easily understand why once I show to you the video and the still images. Um, he had a grade three out of five lameness on the left front limb and a grade two on the right front limb. I'm showing to you here just the images of the left, which was the worst limb, but he definitely had changes on the right as well. The horse went uh, sound after palmar digital nerve block on both front feet. And what we see here is a really large um, flexor cortex defect. This is about two centimeters wide. We also see that in the sagittal view. But if you look closely 
just dorsal to the lesion, you see some other lesions in the navicular bone that are more easily seen with the video. So I'm gonna move in a slow motion here. So what we also notice, and so you see those two hyperattenuating spots, those are distal frag fragments on the lateral and medial angle of the navicular bone. Then advancing the image, you see pretty large hypoattenuating lesions. Those are not the flexor cortex defect. And moving more palmarly, you see the very large flexor cortex defect. This is a 3D reconstruction of this same horse where you can see uh, the very large uh, erosion and the back of the, the navicular bone and also the two distal border fragments. This horse, uh, we, we placed the rocker rail shoes with that bar on the palmar aspect to um, protect against concussion. Um, and this horse was treated only with osphos, a cycle, short cycle of but and he was transitioned to fire coxib and, uh, and shoeing. We did not inject any joint or bursa. And this horse, a few weeks later, won a race, uh, a local race. The client was very satisfied, came back for reshoeing, and the horse was uh, basically sound um, before the second cy uh, shoeing cycle here with us. So we move on to now, this is not an obiquitous case, uh, as you can guess looking at these images. This was a two, a 12 year old thoroughbred, I'm sorry, uh, with a history of a right front limb lameness and chronic uh, abscesses um, associated with that lameness. Um, we CT this horse to initially to confirm the presence and the extent of the infection. Uh, what we see on this image is the affected foot, the horse had a crack and these are marks placed with uh, barium paste. We also added some at the bottom here, just to help us define the extension of the lesion and, and uh, prepare for surgery. So this is a video, an axial CT image of that foot. And what you see is a, cylindrical hypotenuating lesion, so a bony defect basically on the dorsal medial aspect of the coffin bone. This is consistent with the keratoma. I'm gonna to show to you on the right a video, and a sagittal video of the same foot where if you pay attention to the tip of the P3, see it's gone at some point and then it returns there as the slides move from lateral to medial. So that's the area I'm gonna go see if I can find it. We'll see, that's the area where the uh, keratoma was found uh, in surgery. This is a 3D reconstruction of the front feet of the same horse. And you see that bony defect on coughing bone you see the barium paste, those five white dots, and you see some debris here on the top of that, um, of that defect. That's, that's consistent where the crack was. The pictures on the right show, so this is the foot with the horse under general anesthesia. We, uh, the day before, before removing the barium paste, or after removing the barium paste, we grooved a little bit those areas just to make sure we had our landmarks um, the day of surgery, which was the next day. The mass, so the hoof wall was resected at this area, as you can see on the post-op picture here, and the mass was submitted for histopath and confirmed to be a keratoma. The bottom picture shows, uh, this was taken two days after surgery when they changed the bandage. You see the surgical site, an extensive hoof wall resection, uh, two metal bars across the hoof wall defect attached with acrylic to both sides of the defect to stabilize the foot. This horse has been doing very well as far as I know. 
Now we move on to a different case. This was a six year old Arabian horse referred for CT. About 10 days prior to presentation, he became acutely lame in the right forelimb while being launched in the round pain. Um, he was treated initially with butte, he was kept in the stall, but uh, no improvement was seen. So the veterinarian came uh, to see the horse perform a PD block and the horse went sound after PD block. So the veterinarian decided to send the horse for CT. On the CT, we found a fracture of the third phalanx localizing the lateral aspect of the bone. This was an incomplete, interestingly, it was an incomplete fracture. And uh, if you pay attention closely uh, to the fracture line on the right aspect, I have to pause the video so I can show to you. That's the fracture line. It goes all the way to the, all the way adjacent to the margin of the articular surface. This horse was treated with, uh, with um, showing an immobilization of that, of that foot, but um, I, I, we have not heard how the horse did uh, after treatment. He was grade three out of the five lane when he came in. Now uh, we'll uh, move on to another horse with the P3 fracture. This was a six and a half year old thoroughbred mare. Um, after a turnout in the indoor arena, she became almost no way bearing lame on the right hind. The owner suspected to be an abscess with the horse in the stall, did not improve. The scenario was quite similar to the case before. So um, a few days later, the veterinarian went to the farm, took radiographs and diagnosed a P3 fracture with the radiograph. So, the case was referred to us for further evaluation and uh, advanced imaging. When we CT the horse, we confirmed the presence of that fracture, which was an articular fracture, a baxial articular fracture. We classified as a type two distal phalanx fracture, but we also found a uh, relatively large cyst-like lesion on the coffin bone. Um, we discussed, this is a 3D reconstruction of the fracture bone, which shows quite nicely the fracture line. We discussed with the client um, treatment options, including conservative options and surgical options. And the decision was made to treat the horse conservatively. So this horse was uh, treated with a bar shoe that was cast to the foot. And he returned 10 weeks later for our, with appointment with our farriers. And also we re-CT the horse. And this is the image from the recheck, which showed a quite good amount of bony healing on the, the fracture side. We discussed with the client the fact that it was difficult to determine what lesion was, uh, or, or how much each lesion was contributing to the lameness, but with the history of an acu acute lameness, a week prior to presentation uh, was most likely uh, to be, or at least the majority of the pain most likely to be caused by the fracture. Now we move on to a, one of the first few cases we see here. This is a 13 year old Shire that was initially treated here surgically for a quitter. So the horse had an infected lateral collateral cartilage. Surgery went well, the horse was healing fine, uh, went home, um, but a couple of months later returned to us for evaluation of a persistent draining tract just proximal to um, the coronary band of the lateral aspect of the, foot, of the foot. That's where the surgical part of the surgery was performed. Um, so the picture, I'm not sure if you can see, but there's a T cannula placed in there. We performed a fistulogram. So we brought the horse into the CT room, perform a fistulogram, and uh, that was quite useful because we could determine, I'm trying to pass my slide forward here, but it won't go. 
there we go. We, we were able to determine that that fistula or that draining tract communicate all the way down to the coughing bone. And uh, there's also a suspect sequestrum in that area that, that we were able to successfully debride um, under CT guidance. Now we'll switch gears here to lesions above the foot. This was a uh, six-year-old Arabian stallion show horse who presented with a history of chronic grade three out of five lameness localized to the right front pastern via an interarticular block. Radiographs taken in the field were uh, indicative of fragmentation in the palmar pouch of the pastern joint, as you can see. I hope these images are large enough for you to see, but there's some um, opacities suggested by fragmentation in the, in the um, palmar, palmar pouch of the pastern joint. So we CT the horse and the CT revealed a bilateral uh, fragmentation of the proximal pal palmar articular surface of the middle failings. The right side was, most, uh, was more severely affected with multiple fragments, and uh, one of which was associated with a portion of the proximal palmar articular surface of P2. This is a 3D reconstruction of both front uh, distal limbs, and you see there's a large fragment on the left and multiple fragments on the right. The decision was made to surgically address the lesion in the right forelimb since there was no laminus associated with the left forelimb. Bartroscopy was performed in, in the palmar, palmar pouch on the right front pastern joint, and uh, two of these three large bone fragments were identified. We were able to visualize only two of those fragments. Uh, the Breitman was performed, and uh, the horse did very well after surgery. Now he's back in training and sound. Interestingly, they had, uh, I, I was told that recently this horse developed abscess on the hind limbs and they, so they had to radiograph one of the hind limbs and they also found uh, plantar fragmentation on the pastern joints on the hind limb. Now we, I'm gonna discuss here with you, uh, I'm gonna show to you three, uh, a series of three quite similar cases with similar histories and relatively similar, similar lesions. This is a 13-year-old Lipizaner mare who is used for dressage. It was referred for CT evaluation due to a left hind lameness that was localized uh, to the fetlock using interarticular block. She had a three-month history of lameness uh, and uh, that did not improve with stall rest. She had a grade four out of five lameness and she had moderate effusion and showed quite considerable pain on flexion of the disjoint. So on the radiographs, we, we don't see major lesions, but if you look closely, it, 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 it seems like the medial aspect of the joint is a little narrower than the lateral aspect. On the CT, so the results of CT show the subchondral cyst-like lesion of the medial aspect, uh, on the, so the, the medial condyle of the metacarpus, there's quite extensive sclerosis associated with that lesion. And also, if you look closely to proximal P1, you see hypotenuated lesions on both of these views, more easily, most easily seen on the sagittal view. There was some periosteal perforation next to that segment of P1. And also looking very closely, I hope you guys can see, but there is a hypotenuating line uh, coming from the lesions down to the periosteal um, proliferation. These have been reported previously on CT studies, and uh, it's believed that these are vascular channels. This is the second case um, with a similar history, two-month uh, two history of left forelimb lameness. This was a stallion, pretty large horse. Um, and the lameness was previously localized to the fetlock with intertricular anesthesia. A uh, thorough evaluation with 
radi radiographs and ultrasound was performed by the referring veterinarian. However, no lesion could be found on those two modalities. The horse was then uh, sent to uh, a different place where they performed a bone scan. Um, and the bone scan revealed um, focal intense areas of radiopharmaceutical uptake in the lateral condyle of the left fat lock. Open presentation here with those the horses. So once they found those, uh, unfortunately I don't have the CT images to show, um, the bone scan to show to you, but the horses referred to us for CT once they found that increased uptake on the fat lock. Uh, he was quite painful, grade three to four, hour, grade four out of five, and uh, it showed severe resistance to flexion of that fat lock. It's quite painful, similar to the case before. On CT, uh, we saw, again, a subchondral cyst-like lesion. This was the lateral condyle with some sclerosis, not so much sclerosis as the case before, but there's some sclerosis surrounding the lesion as well. And this is the third case uh, with similar lesion. This was, um, was seen by us initially. Um, well, it was seen in the field and then sent to us for imaging. His, he had a history of bilateral hind limb laminis and uh, most severe on the right hind. Uh, the referring veterinary localized the right hind limb laminis to the fat lock um, with nerve blocks and sent the horse in. So they took radiographs. Again, this is another case. They took radiographs and could not see um, any obvious lesions. So he was sent in for bone scan. The bone scan showed increased uptake on the lateral condyle um, of both hind limbs most uh, easily seen or most obvious on the right hind and less severe on the left hind. So we CT the horse and found uh, again a cyst-like a subchondral cyst-like lesion on the lateral condyle, uh, and this lesion was found on both hind limbs, most severe on the right. Again, these are images on the right side. A good amount of um, sclerosis surrounding that lesion, and a little bit of irregularity on the on the proximal aspect of P1 and the opposing um, articular surface. This is the horse, it's the only horse that I have follow up on. Uh, this horse was injected with um, intraarticular stem cell and it was reported recently that he's doing very well with that injection. Now moving on to a different type of lesion. This uh, was a horse that came in for evaluation of a laminus associated with a laceration. The horse was developed this lesion overnight. The client found the horse in the stall with a three centimeter laceration and the plantar aspect of the fat lock and the horse was quite lame. So we came in, we took, initially took radiographs, found several different fragments, one on the plantar, uh, proximal plantar pouch of fat lock, another one associated with the proximal aspect of the um, distal sagittal ridge, um, proximal sagittal ridge, I should say, I'm sorry. There's another fracture and the base of the medial sesamoid that we can see on the lateral view, also seen on this oblique projection. And one more fracture uh, fragment in the most plantar aspect of the medial sesamoid as well. So we CT the course to have a better idea of what was going on and to confirm the presence, the size and the location of these fragments. The images on the right show um, the proximal size to reach um, fragment on three different um, projections. The image on the middle, the images on the middle show the basilar sesamoidian fragment and the pictures on the right show the plantar fragment uh, on the medial sesamoid. These are 3D reconstructions. Uh, these 3D reconstructions are quite useful for us to plan for surgery. Uh, this horse was treated with arthroscopy to remove those fragments in the plantar pouch of the fat lock and also uh, the brightening of the wound and removal of the plantar of the plantar fragment of the 
of the sesamoid through the wound. So the wound is associated with the very, uh, the most plantar aspect of the sesamoid. So moving on now to lesions up higher. This horse was a two year old quarter horse that was sent in for evaluation and treatment of a open, complete community fracture of the lateral splint bone on the right hind limb. The surgery went well, the horse recovered and eventually from surgery. So we did a partial stectomy, removing the bone uh, from a site just above the fracture site. And uh, the horse was healing fine after surgery for a few days. And then at some point we noticed that the wound healing became static. And there's a quite good amount of uh, persistent discharge and every uh, band that is changed. So we decided to check for other um, possible abnormalities. We took a radiograph and um, we didn't find anything major or conclusive on the radiographs. We found some uh, periosteal perforation in the plantar aspect of the bone and we found what seemed to be a small step here. We could not, we didn't know what to make of this, but again, nothing conclusive. And luckily, the machine was up and running at that time, and this was the very first horse that we CT in our hospital. Uh, and I'm glad uh, the machine was up and running at that time because that made a big difference on the treatment plan. We found a sequestrum uh, fragment and the axial aspect of that, of that remaining splint bone. And this lesion could not be seen on any of other projections on the radiograph. So uh, we removed that fragment uh, standing and once that fragment was removed and the area was debrided, you can see some gas attenuating uh, areas in here. Um, once the fracture, uh, once that fragment is removed, the horse um, did very well and the wound healed uh, just fine. This is a horse that came in um, for a suspect splint bone fracture, the veterinarian noticed a uh, bony swelling on the medial splint bone in the right front, took radiographs, saw what uh, seemed to be a callus, but he wasn't sure, he was not able to determine if there was a fracture line or not on all the, on the radiographic views he uh, took. So he sent the horse in for advanced imaging. We, we did a CT on this horse and we could not find any fracture line neither, so no evidence of fracture, but we did find a quite extensive amount of periosteal or new bone formation um, involving the axial aspect of both medial splint bones and also the, the most palmar aspect on the mid region of the metacarpi. Uh, interestingly, if you see in the axial view, you can see there was a pretty decent amount of bone uh, they were displacing the soft tissues palmarly. Interestingly, this horse was evaluated for lameness uh, afterwards um, and uh, in a different occasion. He was grade two um, out of five lame and both front limbs and he became sound after PD block. So he, he did have palmar foot pain, no major uh, CT abnormalities on the ventricular bone though. So I have drawn these images here just to show to you what a true um, spring bone fracture will look like. Um, this uh, is the lateral splint bone. You can see the fracture, kind of an oblique fracture line in the mid portion, the mid body of the splint bone. And that's the video uh, with the frontal view as well. This horse was successfully treated with surgical, um, uh, with surgery, so a partial ostectomy was performed and he did well after surgery. This is the, uh, one of the last cases we'll show to you, a horse with history of quite significant hock arthritis, um, had been managed conservatively in the field, uh, but the horse continued to be lame, uh, came in and the lameness localized to the hocks, mostly on the right hind. Um, so CT was elected and uh, we, we were quite impressed with the findings. We saw several uh, cyst-like lesions in that third tarsal bone and also associated with the proximal aspect, the third metatarsal bone, and obviously some bone proliferation 
extending proximally, which we can see also on the axial view. So I'm going to run the video. This horse also had some similar lesions, but not this severe on the left hind. Uh, and he also had pretty significant narrowing of the joint space on these hocks. And discussed, uh, was discussed with the client uh, options of surgical arthrodesis or continuing with, um, with uh, conservative treatment and the client elected to continue uh, with a less aggressive treatment. So I'm pretty sure uh, many of you might be asking, um, all right, can you guys image stifle on these horses with this machine? Um, we cannot do stifling standing horses, obviously. Uh, however, we are starting to look at the possibility of imaging stifling recumbent horses. Uh, this is a video, a 3D reconstruction of a horse that we did. Um, uh, this horse, the, the picture on the left, it was a recumbent horse. So the company is working on opening up the gantry, reshaping the gantry a little bit. Uh, so hopefully this joint will be, this joint and, and the most caudal aspect of the neck will be um, imaged without major difficulties in the near future. We also started to look at the use of intravenous contrast. This is just an example of a case. Um, this horse had a lesion in the proximal aspect of the suspensory ligament. Uh, the video on the left is a 3D reconstruction uh, with a, uh, of a vinogram. So this horse, at the time this image was acquired, this horse had a tourniquet above the carpus. And the image on the right was acquired after the tourniquet was removed. So again, these, the contrast was injected in the vein. And we notice uh, contrast enhancement in the proximal suspensory ligament of this horse after um, removing that um, tourniquet at, and re-imaging the horse. So to finalize, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today and say that the standing CT can also be used for other species. Um, this was the very first farm animal that we evaluated with CT. Since then, we have used in, in several other animals. And this particular case was quite useful, as it is in most cases, uh, because this goat that developed a severe lameness on the left front limb, and it was radiographed in the field with beautiful radiographs. And um, unfortunately, no fracture line can be seen on those radiographs. And they're very good quality radiographs. So we decided to CT him, he, and he stood quite well. It was, it was quite interesting to do him. And, and we found that articular fracture um, on the lateral claw, uh, on the P3 uh, of the lateral claw on the left front. The case was managed with a block placed on the medial claw, and uh, he did very well after um, a few weeks with that block. So uh, this tool has been definitely beneficial for us and for our referring veterinarians to diagnose and choose the best treatment options and uh, it can be used for other species um, as well. So with that, I wanna thank you again and I'll pass the word to uh, David. Okay, well, thank you, Diego uh, and also JR and Sabrina for answering a lot of the questions. We still have a few more minutes if people wanna um, type in questions in the Q&A, we can see if we can uh, answer them. Just to make sure, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So there was a question about the shape of the gantry just asked for doing the stifle. Um, that is a project that we are working on with the company itself. So the gantry right now is not shaped, cone shaped, uh, the way we wanted to do the stifle standing. Uh, will we be able to do the stifle standing in the future with the shape, new shape of the gantry? That is a question I cannot answer right now. So uh, it might be a possibility, but I can't make any promises until we have that new shape and we can do some research with it. And then there was another question about how much of the limb we can scan and if there's a limit on it. Um, I think I answered it uh, completely, but just to be clear. So, so basically right now, when we saw those videos of the gantry rising up, um, 
and the sensors on the top so it doesn't hit the animal's belly. So we can bring it up to whatever level, like that's the limitation. So kind of how long their leg is in relation to where their, their belly is. So we bring the gantry up and then initiate the scan. And then from that point down, everything is scanned. Um, so for majority of horses, uh, we can get up to the carpi uh, or the tarsi. It's just if they're very short limbs and a very big belly, um, that's kind of the limitation. So hopefully that makes sense. There was another question coming from, do you do myel uh, myelograms? Um, yes, we have done some myelograms. Uh, not standing, uh, but we have done them under general anesthesia. That was discussed in the last uh, talk, um, the first talk, the last time that we did it. And uh, you are able to see with contrast really nicely the myelograms. Uh, and then the question on intraarterial versus IV contrast um, for the suspensory ligament. Uh, we have only done IV so far. Um, now that we have a soft tissue window, we're going to be doing more with kind of timing and routes of administration while the horses are standing. Um, so far, we've been pretty happy with the IV contrast images, um, but, but yeah, we'll see what comes with that. Another question that was asked just now, have horses kicked the machine? Yes, they have. Um, not by touching their belly. We have so far not had any horses had the machine touch their belly, so the scanner uh, really stops right in time, but we have had horses kick uh, by doing limb scans and um, this machine survived as well as the horse survived as well as all the people survived. So, so far, no casualties whatsoever. Thank you all for joining us today and I hope to see you again uh, when Dr. Chris Witten of the University of Melbourne uh, talks about how it's applied the CT in the racehorse industry. Okay, thank, thank you. you all. Thank Thanks you. everyone, have a good day. Uh,